Okay, I'll say something. <laughs> something. Okay, uh, we're going to sing Walk With Me. And in Psalms 143.8, it says, Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. Walk with me, walk with me, lest mine eyes no longer see all the glory, all the story of your love. Talk with me, talk to me, like you spoke so tenderly. The shore of Galilee. Let me learn to pray like he did in the garden of Gethsemane. Take my hand. Take my hand, teach me, Lord, to understand all the duty, all the beauty of your love. Talk with me, talk with me, lest my ears no longer hear. All the wonder, all the beauty of your grace. Walk with me, walk with me, as you walk so lovingly. When you walk there, when you talk there, by the sea. Let me follow in the footsteps that trod the shore of Galilee. Let me learn to pray like he did in the garden.
Teach me, Lord, to understand all my duty, all my beauty of your love. So a lot of them had Bibles, and you know, at First Baptist Howard, we are BYOB, bring your own Bible. And if you brought your own Bible today, I hope you have a pencil and a highlighter or something, because there's going to be a couple verses here that you're going to have to highlight or underline. Don't do it in the pew Bibles, please. <laughs> but if you have your own Bible, you may want to mark some verses down this morning as we start to look into Romans chapter 8. And we'll pick up with verse 1 this morning with a message entitled, The Law of the Spirit. The Law of the Spirit. So if you would like to stand and honor the Word of God, we'll pick up in verse 1 this morning. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. There is therefore... Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. May it be to us today a fountain that refreshes the weary heart and a fountain which satisfies the hungry soul. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Today, we open up Romans chapter 8. I believe it's one of the best chapters in your Bible. And if Romans is considered the cathedral of the Bible, Romans chapter 8 should be its most sacred sh shrine, the highest altar of worship. Even commentator Donald Gray Barnhouse suggested that if you were to accidentally drop your Bible on the ground, it should automatically open up to Romans chapter 8 because it should be just so well worn, so well used, so well meditated upon that it should just automatically just poof, Romans chapter 8. Because it is in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul begins with a statement that says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The chapter ends with a triumphant declaration that there is no separation for those believers who are in Christ Jesus. And in between, God is causing all things to work together for good. And as we pick this up this morning, just a brief recap of what we've already seen through the book of Romans. In chapters 1 and 2, we saw our need for salvation. In chapters 3 and 4, we saw the provision of our justification. Chapter 5, the blessing of our justification. Chapter 6, our freedom from sin. Chapter 7, our freedom from the law and the battle that we fight within. And it is here in chapter 8, that we finally come to realize the victory and the power that we have through the Holy Spirit. It is in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit is mentioned 20 times. And if we look at this chapter, we can't separate it 
from chapter 7. Because everything is so connected. The end of chapter 7 is connected with chapter 8. And it's today we break through into living in the power of the Spirit of God. And I just want to look at a few things this morning with you from this chapter. First, I want to look at an exclamation of liberty. Secondly, an examination of two laws. And then thirdly, the enabling power to live this life. So as this chapter begins, it begins not subtly, not slowly, but he begins with an exclamation mark for the believer with an exclamation of liberty. Look at this verse, verse 1. This is a verse you may need to underline, you may need to put it in your heart this morning. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And you may, in your Bible, may have a small footnote, endnote underneath there. And the whole story behind that is your oldest and your best manuscripts do not include who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So rightfully, this verse basically reads like this. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, period. There is no condemnation. Friends, because remember what happened last week, right? Chapter 7, there's a struggle within. And Paul asked this question. He said, who will deliver me from this body of death? He didn't say how. He didn't say when. He said who. And then in verse 25, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he breaks through with this beautiful statement of liberty that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, look, when you look through the Bible, when you look through the Pauline letters especially, when you think about all that you have in Christ Jesus, it's enormous. Let me just pull out a few things for you this morning. Our redemption is in Christ Jesus. The love of God is in Christ Jesus. We are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Our liberty is in Christ Jesus. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are His workmanship in Christ Jesus. God's eternal purposes are in Christ Jesus. The high calling of God is in Christ Jesus. Our riches and glory are in Christ Jesus. You get the point. All that we need is in Christ Jesus. And Paul says now, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Does that not minister to your heart? Condemnation, what is condemnation? Condemnation is the penalty in which the verdict demanded. We already saw the law. The law said, what? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. The law demanded that we should die. But Christ Jesus, he actually took the penalty that we deserved, and we can be now declared not guilty. But friend, let me suggest to you this morning, there are people and there are things out there who want to condemn us. Oftentimes we want to condemn ourselves, don't we? We mess up, we make a mistake, we fall into sin, and guess what happens? We start to feel all this condemnation, all this guilt, and all this shame. We just sang a song, it said, we were burning with shame. You don't have to feel that this morning, because there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you who else would like to accuse you. The devil loves to accuse you. Satan. His name means the accuser, the adversary. The Bible says he accuses you day and night before the throne of God. There's a wonderful picture in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah has eight visions. And in Zechariah chapter 3, it is a wonderful vision that this man has. And he has Joshua, the high priest, standing there. And Satan is standing there right with him. And he's accusing him before God. And he says... And and the Lord is there, and he says, No, Satan, I rebuke you. And he says, Is this man not a brand plucked from the fire? Friends, isn't that what we are? We're brands plucked from the fire. And Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is our advocate. 
He's a, our defense attorney. There's no defense attorney team like Jesus Christ. Don't you want Jesus Christ at your defense? Huh? He's the one saying, you know what? Yes, Satan is accusing you. You know, oh, Derek, he did this. Oh, Derek, he did that. And Jesus Christ says, no, hold on. He's my son. And he's forgiven. And there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Friends, let me tell you, though, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is that guilt that you feel, that heaviness, that shame, and it pulls you away from the cross. But conviction is the work of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit draws you to the cross in forgiveness. Okay, remember what Jesus said to the woman that was called in adultery? Everybody else was ready to stone her. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Friends, conviction draws us close to the cross. Condemnation pulls us away from the cross. Maybe today you feel condemned. Maybe today you feel, feel as if you failed. Maybe you failed in your marriage. Maybe you failed serving God. Maybe you feel like you failed that at work in some type of way. Maybe you feel as you failed as a parent. Let me suggest today, do not listen to those voices. Listen to the Spirit of God today who says, you know what? You are not condemned. You are loved. You are accepted. You are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Friends, this chapter opens with this exclamation of liberty. And now he moves on. He says, okay, after this exclamation of liberty, he examines two laws that are at work. Again, he likes to compare things. Verses 2 to 4. <clears throat> For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And again, Paul loves to compare and to contrast these things. And he uses two laws. He said there's the law of the spirit, which is the law of life. And then there's the law of the spirit or the law of sin and death. One law is producing life and freedom. The other law is producing death and bondage. And you say, okay, how can there be no condemnation for the believer? Because look, we already said, what, there's a struggle going on. Sometimes we sin. Sometimes we feel this battle going on. Well, because, listen, Jesus has declared us not guilty by taking the penalty that we deserved, the death that we deserved, he took. And look at this thing. It says, the law was weak. It was weak. It was ineffective. It was incapable. There's no way we could have been made right by following the law because we couldn't do it. It was weak. But look, it says, God did. God did the work. God did by sending his son to fulfill the requirements of the law for us. Friends, this was not a work of man. This was a work of Almighty God. The, the law could not do it, so God took it upon himself by sending his son to do the work for us. And are the, all the requirements of the law were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The perfect, sinless son of God kept the law perfectly, and he died to take the penalty that we deserved. And now we have the Holy Spirit in us, indwelling us, and we are free to enjoy all the blessings and all the benefits and to be the people God desired us to be. And you say, hold on, hold on. This sounds a lot like double talk, right? You said there's a law of sin and a law of death, and there's the law of the Spirit, and there's this battle between the flesh and this battle between the Spirit going on. So how does this all work? How, does, you know, how do we put these nuts and bolts together? And last week I used the illustration of the two dogs fighting. Let me try to explain it with another illustration this morning. There was a father and son. They were walking in the spring in the forest. 
And the son asks the dad, he says, asks the dad about the law of gravitation. And he explains to his son that the law of gravitation is the law of nature by which everything is pulled downward. And he picks up a stone and he drops the stone and it goes poop. And then he picks up a stick and then he drops the stick and it goes to the ground. And as they walk along, the son says to the father, Father, what about that tulip over there? That tulip doesn't seem to be affected by the law of gravitation because it's, it's growing upward. What's going on? And the father says, son, there's another law at work within that tulip, and it is the law of life. And that law is stronger than the law of gravitation. And as long as that tulip is alive, it is free to grow upward. And the same is true for each one of us, my friends. There are two laws at work within each and every believer of Jesus Christ. But the law of the Spirit is so much stronger than the law of sin and death. And this law of the Spirit is what allows us to grow upward, to keep going forward in a world, in a culture, in a nation where everything else is pulling you downward. You say, how can I keep going? How can I live this Christian life? How can I serve God? How can I live as God called me to live? The law of the Spirit. Look, you say, how will I do this? How will I continue? How will I do anything? The law of the Spirit. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 says, Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. It's not by my skills. It's not by my resources. It's not by my programs. It's not by my ingenuity. It's by the Spirit of God. Friends, I cannot tell you how many examples I can give to you today. People serving God in all different types of capacities, whether it's music, whether it's teaching, whether it's street ministry, or whatever it is. I can't do it. That's right. You can't do it. But the Spirit of God can do it in you, friends. That is the law of the Spirit. So he evaluates these two laws, and now he evaluates two walks. Look at verses 5 to 10. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But the, you who are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. So now Paul contrasts basically two different mindsets with two different outcomes. And he says there's two type of mindsets going on. You have the carnal mind and you have the spiritual mind. Again, one producing death, one producing life. Listen, the, the person or even the believer who lives simply on the carnal plane is basically living on an animalistic plane. When am I going to eat? When am I going to sleep? When is my pleasure coming? All this temporary stuff that we live for, they're just basically living on this temporary plane. And he says, you know what? It leads to death. And also, he says, it's at war with God. Listen, it loves what God hates and it loathes what God loves. That is the carnal-minded believer or the carnal-minded individual. But he says the spiritual-minded, he says, is life and peace. The spiritual mind is life and peace. Which one do you want? Do you want war with God or do you want life and peace? Again, we talked last week, the Bible talks so much about the mind. The Bible says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Let me ask us today as a body, I ask myself the same question, what dominates our thoughts. Is it carnal or is it spiritual? What controls your thoughts? Because if you are controlled by the Holy Spirit, your thoughts will be of the Spirit. 
If you are controlled by the flesh, your thoughts will be to the flesh. Listen, even people coming to church, I cannot tell you how often it happens and how often you can hear these type of things. People come to church with a carnal mind. And this is what I mean. You come to church and all you can think about is, where am I getting lunch? What am I doing afterwards? What's my agenda? What game is on TV? All these things are carnal. And he says, you need to come to church. When we come to church, we have to have the mind of the Spirit. Do you come to church expecting to hear from God? Do you expect to be worshiping Him with your heart, with your mind, with your spirit? Again, the carnal mind versus the spiritual mind. And then he says in verse 8, again, another verse worth underlining in your Bible. Verse 8, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot please God in the flesh. Listen, if you are not in Christ and you are in the flesh, you cannot please God. It doesn't matter how many good works you do. It doesn't matter how much food that you give to the food bank. It doesn't matter how many checks that you cut to this charity because the Bible says that our good works are as filthy rags and it's literally menstruating rags that's what it looks like in the eyes of almighty god when you compare it to the holiness of god he says that is what your good works looks like if you are trying to do this in your flesh he said it's not going to please me at all but church i need you to be listening to me are you listening okay are you listening the flesh cannot please god but the flesh can produce something. It can produce something. And what do you mean? Listen, the flesh can produce something within your marriage. The flesh can produce something within this church. The flesh can produce something within your home. If you are not careful, it can produce destruction. Let me give you an example. Remember way back in the book of Genesis? Way back, way back. Cain and Abel two brothers, right? And God says, I want you to bring a sacrifice to me. And it's as if God indicated that he wanted a blood sacrifice. Abel brings a blood sacrifice, but Cain brings the fruit of his hands. And he says, he basically comes to God his own way and says, you know what, I'm going to come to God my own way, and I'm going to present to him the work of my hands. It's a work of the flesh. And God said, I'm not going to honor that. And we all know the story how Cain kills Abel, and it goes on from there. But also another work of the flesh, Abraham. God said to Abraham, he said, I'm going to give you a son, okay, through your wife Sarah. It's delayed, it's delayed, it's delayed. And then finally, Abraham and Sarah have this wonderful idea that, you know, you should have a son through Hagar, my Egyptian maidservant. And guess what's produced? Ishmael. And Ishmael is, again, another work of of the flesh. And God said, I'm not going to honor that. If we are operating in the flesh, if we are trying to come to God in our own way, in our own time, with our own things, he says, it's not going to please me. It has to be a work of the Spirit of God. We cannot please God in the flesh. And then in verse 10, he says, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Again, there's two laws at work within us. But and if time goes by, and if the Lord doesn't come back, and I believe the Lord's coming back sooner than later, but if time goes by, eventually all of these bodies of ours are going to be pulled down back into the dust of the ground. But here's the thing. That is not the end. Because though the outward man is perishing day by day, the Bible says the inward man is be, being renewed day by day. Because look, when we die, we go straight to be with the Lord. For the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Look, this body may die, but the spirit will live on. So he contrasts these laws and these walks and these mindsets and then finally this morning, he gives us the key to all of this. Verse 11. Friends, this is a verse we must hide in our hearts. Listen to this verse. 
But if the Spirit of God, or Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. This is an amazing verse, my friends. You can say, okay, I accept there's no condemnation for me. Okay? I accept that there's a battle, there's a struggle going on in my, in, within me. I understand that there's the law of sin and the law of death and the law of the Spirit. And you say, look, I can't do it. No, we can't do it. But listen, God has given us the power to do it through His Spirit. Look, this is, these aren't just little cute Bible stories and cute yarns that, that are spun in this book to, to, to tell our children. No, these are life-changing truths that can change your life. Friends, he talks about the resurrection. And all three persons of the Trinity are involved in the resurrection. The Father was involved in the resurrection. Acts chapter 2, verse 24 Jesus was involved in the resurrection. He said, nobody takes my life, but I lay it down of my own accord. And if I lay it down, I'm going to take it back up again. And in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, the Spirit of God is involved in the resurrection. All three persons of the Trinity involved in the resurrection. And look, we can't do it in the flesh. But again, we have power through the Spirit of God. Friends, we need to grab hold of this truth this morning. Okay? Again, are you listening? Are you listening? The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. That's what this verse says. Let that just sink in for a moment. God said that he raised Christ up, and he will raise us up also. So let me ask you, what do you need power for today? Do you need power to just continue to go forward? Maybe you say, look, my life is so messed up. I am dealing with so much right now. You don't understand. I, I'm, just, I'm just happy if I can wake up in the morning. What do you need power for today? Do you need power to overcome addiction Do you need power to forgive somebody? The Bible says here, there is power enough in the Holy Spirit. I want to remind you once more today, the same God, the same God who split the Red Sea lives in you. The same God who toppled the walls of Jericho lives in you. The same God who made fire fall on Mount Carmel lives in you. The same God who empowered a shepherd boy to take down a giant with a sling and a stone lives in you. And the same God who raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And he says this. It's a promise of God right here. He says, he will give life to your mortal bodies. He said life. That word life means to quicken. It means to revitalize, bring to action. So with that said, my friends... We talked about this struggle, right? Let me ask you this question today. Is that power enough to overcome the flesh? Amen. Amen. Yes, this is power enough to overcome the flesh. Is there a struggle? Absolutely. But guess what? He has given us power that we don't have to live in that anymore. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. So let me ask one more question. Why are we stuck in chapter 7? We don't need to be stuck in chapter 7. We can live, friends, in Romans chapter 8. And there was an old story about a a preacher and an elderly lady, old Christian saint. And the old preacher, or the preacher just got done expounding on chapter 7 and 8 of Romans. And she said to the man, she said, you don't understand them chapters. He said, what, is something wrong? He said, she said, you talk as if we're to live in the misery of the seventh and only make short visits to the eighth. He said, that's what I think, don't you? She replied, oh no, honey, the dear saint said, I live in the eighth chapter. And friends, that is my prayer for each and every one of us right here. 
that we don't live in that seventh chapter of Romans, but we live in the eighth chapter of Romans. And God said, you know what? The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. And that is power enough, friends, to defeat the flesh. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just thank you for these words this morning. Um, just glorious, just truths for us to just sit upon and to meditate upon. But also, Lord, these truths are to be lived out. And Lord, we thank you so much that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, that we are free of the guilt, we are free of the sin, we are free of the things that want to bring us down and the accusations that the enemy brings against us. We thank you. We also thank you, Lord, for the enabling of your Holy Spirit. Lord, often we neglect the Holy Spirit, but it's the Holy Spirit that works in and through us to do and to work of your good pleasure. So, Father, today, as we think about these truths, Lord, May we as a, a body be filled again with your spirit, not to live according to the flesh, that we would not try to please you in the flesh, but that we would live in the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray for those today maybe struggling with something, um, something that's just been bringing them down lately. Maybe it's a mindset, maybe it's a habit, maybe it's just a, just a carnal thought, Lord, that just doesn't want to leave them. I pray today they would know the freedom that they have, that they would grab hold of these truths, Lord, that we just looked at, and they would take them to heart, and that they would say, you know what? Today is going to be the day I start to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, because I can't live it on my own. But today, Lord, may it be a day where they understand and they live in the victory and the power that you gave to us through your spirit. And Lord, as we battle, as we struggle in this world, may we always remember there's a greater law at work within us. And it is the law of the spirit. And it allows us to grow. It allows us to thrive. And it allows us to move, even in a world that is dragging us and trying to pull us down. Lord, we thank you so much that you didn't leave us as orphans but that you gave to us your Holy Spirit. And we pray this, Lord, in your name. Amen. And as the, uh, the musician...